Hello and welcome to TickMe, Time Critical Medical Education. My name is Dr Nick Taylor, I'm an emergency physician from the Canberra Hospital. Today's tutorial is one that I really have a lot of interest in and it's about decision, errors and cognition. We're going to break this tutorial up into three easily digestible parts. Today's is part one and we're going to learn about how we make decisions. So. In emergency, we make massive numbers of decisions every hour. There are a lot of studies saying that emergency physicians essentially make up to two decisions every minute for their entire shift. They also get interrupted every 30 seconds for that shift. So there's a lot of cognitive pressure on. There are varieties of different decision making types that people use in order to make decisions. And good clinicians use different strategies at different times. It's important to know that these different strategies that people use to make decisions are prone to different sorts of error types. So what sorts of decisions do we make? Now, this is a table from a fantastic article I fully recommend to anyone who wants to read in a bit more depth. Pat Crosskerry's landmark article in Academic Emergency Medicine from 2002. So this is just a small smattering of the sort of decisions that emergency clinicians make all the time. You know, even when you're talking to your patient, you're trying to work out what their social background is, what their preferences are. You use that information to be able to take your history, present a complaint properly, take all their past medical history, do an exam, try and interpret things along the way and work out what to ask next or examine next. You have to order tests, interpret tests, compare them to your history exam and clinical information to try and work out what's going on. You have to start treating the patient, make decisions about doses and what treatment and the evidence base for those. You have to refer people on. You have to make sure they end up in the right place at the right time. You have to provide teaching if that's your role as well. There's also in emergency departments, particularly a, a lot of non-clinical jobs you've got to do whilst you're trying to do these other things. You've got to work out where your patients are going to go, who's been waiting for a long time, what's your next priority, is there any flow issues going on, is things going to cost too much, is there significant administrative pressures on you. So all of that is bundled in together. So how do we come about to make decisions. Well, in the 70s there was a theory, a psychological theory put forward that there are two main types of decision making strategies we use, System 1 and System 2. System 1 is an automatic and fast way of thinking with very little voluntary control or effort. System 2 is used when you need to concentrate, choose, calculate and it requires effort. So here's another table from that fantastic cross carry article and it divides the system 1 and system 2 type of decisions up into different characteristics. And you can see that if you look at system 1, which is the intuitive and automatic style of decision making, that you tend to do things by making associations, you tend to be able to process in parallel with other things. You're not actually very aware that you're doing it, you don't have very much control over it. As we said, it was high, highly automatic but it's very rapid. It's not very reliable because you're making lots of associations, so there's lots of errors possible. And those errors are in a normative distribution. As we said, it's low effort and there's high emotional valence. And what that means is depending on the sort of mood you're in, you might make different decisions using System 1. There's lowly detail, there's not very much scientific rigor, and it's highly contextual based on what's going on around you. Now system two is our analytic model of decision making. It's a rule based systematic which needs serial processing so it's a bit hard to do while you're doing something else. You're highly cognitively aware that you're doing it and you do have a lot of control over what you're doing but it's not very automatic. It's slow but it is reliable and the trouble is if you make an error using system two it tends to be a big one because you've got lots of points leading up to that and lots of points stepping away from the point where you made an error. It's lots of effort required, it's got a high predictive power, it's not as dependent on emotional factors. There is a highly detailed approach with lots of scientific rigor and the context isn't quite as important. So are we getting our head around system one and system two yet? 
There are other ways you can use to describe the sorts of decision process we use, particularly in emergency, and, and they are heuristics, pattern recognition, the rule out worst case scenario technique, which a lot of us in critical care use and will get told to use when we're junior. Make sure that's not an infarct and then worry about the musculoskeletal pain. There's the exhaustive method, which is classically more your physician model, where we'll work through something from one point and end up at the far end and rule everything out in between. Not so great in the middle of a packed recess. And the hypothetical deductive model, which is more classically your scientific approach. Come up with a hypothesis, test your hypothesis by designing an experiment and prove your hypothesis was correct. So I've been doing a fair bit of reading around decisions and cognition and I've discovered some fantastic books along the way. Probably the best book that describes System 1 and System 2 in great detail is Thinking Fast and Slow by the Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman. So let's see what we can learn from thinking fast and slow. Okay, I want you to read this sentence. Sharks eat lollies. Just see what you think about it. Now when you get a chance to think rapidly, you're probably thinking almost straight away of sharks and lollies together. And Almost straight away, some of you might be getting some mental images. You might be getting some pictures in your head of sharks, and you might also be getting some pictures in your head of lollies, like jelly beans. And you might actually put those two things together and think to yourself quite rapidly, well, sharks could eat lollies. Sharks maybe do eat lollies. I wonder what sort of lollies sharks like. But when you sit down and actually concentrate on it, furrow your brow a little bit, you realise, no, sharks don't eat lollies. They eat surfers. I'm a surfer. I'm a bit worried. So what's actually happened here? Why did, for a moment, right away, straight away, we almost think to ourselves, well, sharks do eat lollies and maybe they like jelly beans? Well, to understand something, a concept, rapidly, we initially try and believe it's true. And that gullibility of our cognition is the job of system one. Your associative memory is creating images in your mind, in your mind trying to make you believe. And this process leads to a problem called confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is that if you get some evidence for something, you will immediately believe something to be true. But the trouble is the associations your rapid system one memory might be making may not actually be correct. And the confirmation bias of system one favors believing in improbable occurrences. This can be a problem when we're on the floor looking after patients and we are trying to connect the dots of a patient's presentation with something that we're familiar with before. It's very easy to jump to conclusions about a diagnosis. If we think about things in more detail, then we're going to start using System 2. Unbelieving something is the job of System 2. Now, if System 2 is otherwise engaged doing something else, then we will believe almost anything. And this has been beautifully proven with a number of really clever psychological experiments. System 2 confirms first by looking for positive confirmation, compatible with beliefs that we already hold. So, will Ron be good at sport? Well, I don't know. I don't know, Ron. Well, he is strong and fast. Okay, so straight away, you're starting to think, well, I think Ron probably is pretty good at sport because he's strong and fast. Well, Ron might be completely uncoordinated or Ron might have no arms, in which case he wouldn't be very good at sports where you need to catch a ball, for example. But on the basis of the information provided, we think Ron probably is good at sport because he's strong and fast. You can see that at work, is the chest pain musculoskeletal in nature? Well, if the patient says, oh, I'm tender there and I've been doing weights, immediately we'd like to believe, well, yeah, sure, makes sense. Chest pain probably is musculoskeletal. So we need to fight against this instinct to rapidly believe something based on limited information. 
In our mind, we've got pictures, mental pictures of a bloke in the gym lifting up a heavy weight going, oh, geez, my chest is sore now, when really what could have happened, he could have had an infarct. And so we need more information in Gage System 2 to double check. So the measure of System 1 success is the coherence of the story that it creates not the quality or the quantity of the story and that makes it easy to jump to conclusions and that's known in psych terms as the what you see is all there is fallacy in that you are led to believe in the information in front of you last week someone came in to my ED with leg pain and it turned out they were having an infarct. Crazy, hey? The association I've made, therefore, is that if you've got leg pain, well, having an MI might actually be something that is common because I've just recently seen someone who had leg pain and ended up having an infarct. What happens there, and this happens to all of us, that you've seen three PEs in three days, and for the next three days, everyone with chest pain's got a PE. Well, this is known as the availability heuristic. We estimate the frequency of a category by the ease of which examples of the category come to mind. So, we are more likely to go with the availability of flow using System 1 without checking with System 2 when we're engaged in another task at the same time. Gee, that's never happened in an emergency department. So system two is otherwise doing something else. We're in a good mood, so everything's feeling happy and funky, and we're more likely to go, yeah, I believe it. If you are knowledgeable about something, but you're not an expert, so you know enough, but you don't know everything. If you score high on scales of faith in intuition, and if you are, or if you feel powerful, so you're more likely to believe in the examples that come rapidly to mind if one of these or more of these things are happening at once. Here's a quote from a famous person which helps to explain how the availability heuristic affects decision making. I don't take polls to tell me what is the right way to act. I've just got to know how I feel. Anyone know who said this? Someone who probably was well known for not making very good decisions. And yet that was George W. in 2002. So he trusted his instincts. He didn't like getting information to make his decisions. So, moving on, let's give you a bit of a hypothetical. A 21-year-old female rower comes into you with left parasternal pleuritic chest pain. Straight away, without spending too much time, does she have a P, a muscle sprain, or pneumonia? What do you think? Okay. So, a 21-year-old female rower who is on the oral contraceptive pill and has recently come back from a rowing meet in Switzerland has pleuritic left-sided chest pain. Does she have a PE, a muscle sprain, or pneumonia? So, which of you thought that in the first case musculoskeletal pain was more likely? Probably most. And which of you thought in this case here that we now need to start thinking that a PE is more likely? Be honest. For those of you who thought that the PE was more likely in this case, were you correct? And if you weren't, what just happened? Well, the reality is is that the answer to both those questions is musculoskeletal pain. And what's happened in the second case is that we've been victims to representation bias. People tend to judge probability by representativeness. And that is similarity to known stereotypes. And that is we are trying to use examples known to us to judge the probability of occurrence but we're not very good at using the base rate, i.e. what is the statistical likelihood of a condition, in order to judge these probabilities. So, an obese male is more likely to be diabetic than a skinny one. 
But when stereotypes are false or base rates are low, we get it wrong. So let's think about that female rower. She's been rowing. She's got pleuritic chest pain. The likelihood, the base rate of PE and pneumonia in a healthy 21-year-old is low. The likelihood of an athlete who uses chest muscles for a living to having musculoskeletal pain is very high. Why did it change when we thought about her coming back from Switzerland and being on the pill? Well, the question is, does it alter the base rate of PE enough to supplant musculoskeletal pain? Well, how many 21-year-old females are on the pill? And the likelihood is it's probably over 70 to 80%. So that's not modifying our base rate very much at all. And is a single plane flight a significant risk factor for PE? The answer is no. So what we've done is we've used two bits of information which only very mildly modify our base rate, and we've let them determine our overall sense of the probability of an occurrence. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't consider a PE in this lady. I'm just saying that the far more likely diagnosis is still musculoskeletal pain. So what is the keys to understanding base rate and Bayesian reasoning? Well, you need to anchor your judgment about the probability of an outcome based on a plausible base rate. And you need to question the evidence that's put up in front of you about how diagnostic it is. And a great way to think about it is in terms of positive or negative predictive value. We like to talk a lot in our department about pretest probability and whether the new information is going to alter that or not. So what we're talking about is what is the likelihood of the base rate being modified by new information. It's one of the keys to being, I think, a mature and good emergency clinician. So let's move on. Another fantastic chapter in Daniel Kahneman's book. I've modified it a bit to make it a little bit more ED specific. We're going to talk about prospect theory and framing. Woo. Okay. Imagine the following hypothetical. Ebola reaches Canberra, or your town, and it's going to kill 600 people. Full stop. Already predicted 600 people are going to die. There are two programs that are going to try and combat it, put forward by the experts. In the first one, 200 people will be saved. In the second plan, there is a third probability that 600 people will be saved, but a two-thirds chance that no one will be saved. Your job, as part of the medical directorate is to decide which program you're going to pick. Which one did you come up with? In a similar sort of uh, problem that's been put forward to lots of people in many psychological studies, an overwhelming majority of people in this problem pick uh, number A. Right. So you weren't very happy with that program. So you went back to your public health people and you said, look, we need two more options. Can you produce them for us? So they do. And in this one, 400 people are going to die in their first strategy. And in their second strategy, there's a third chance that no one's going to die, but there's a two-third chance that 600 people will die. Which one are you going to pick now? Well, in this case, the majority of people overwhelmingly in huge studies pick option B. So why is it, and you probably should know if you haven't already worked it out, that all of these options are equal in terms of the chance or probability of people dying. Why is it that in the first case more people choose the set fact that 200 people will get saved, but in the second option, this one here, where 200 people saved is converted to 400 people will die, are we more likely to go with a gamble? Well, this is because choices between gambles and sure things are resolved differently depending on if the outcomes are good or bad. If the outcome is good, we vastly prefer sure things over gambles. And if the outcome is bad, we will prefer to take a chance. It's a very bizarre way of thinking. It's been very well proven over many years, particularly in lots of excellent studies around gambling. 
System 1 intuition provides a moral intuitive framework. Remember we said it had a high emotional valence? System 2, however, provides no moral assistance whatsoever. So we sometimes make a snap decision based on what feels right. System 2 doesn't help you to use emotion and moral thinking if you're going to use statistics. So if you were to work all those things out nice and slowly, you would have come to the conclusion that they're all equal and then it wouldn't have mattered which ones you've picked. But when you made a rapid decision with System 1, the way that those choices made you feel significantly influenced your decision. So this leads us to talk about intuition versus algorithms. Humans are very inconsistent when interpreting the same information. Lots of studies have shown that the inter-observer reliability of a CTPA interpretation by radiologists varies from only 60 to about 85%. And remember, there's a lot of System 1 in radiology interpretation is much more than you would expect. System 1 is very context dependent. Clinicians as a group are very resistant to the demystification of expertise. They would like to believe that they make good decisions because they are fantastic clinicians and it's all happening upstairs in this wonderful brain. And they hate thinking that decisions are being made because a computer or an algorithm told they to told them to. When they've studied these things, the other thing clinicians hate is the thought that an algorithm was responsible for a bad outcome. They're much more likely to be accepting of a bad outcome when it's simple human error than if a computer or a program made the error which caused a bad outcome. This is even the case when you can prove to people that the algorithm is going to make fewer errors than the humans. There's some really cool little studies around which have looked at this. One of the best ones in non-medical literature is a wine algorithm. A bloke developed a computer program because he worked out that the success of a wine vintage was almost entirely dependent on climate factors where the vineyards were located, so based on temperature, frosts, rainfall, etc. He developed an algorithm that predicted with 90% accuracy how successful a wine vintage was and he didn't have to taste them. This was put out quite a few years ago and was universally pillared by wine experts across the world. They were much more likely to believe that their sniffing, tasting and spitting was far more successful and they were grossly resistant to the concept that an algorithm beat them all ends up. Now in medicine, we have successfully managed to introduce some algorithm-based things which grossly outperform clinicians. And everyone will be familiar with APGAR schools. It's one of the very first examples. But PE diagnosis recently has really been improved by um, Klein, for example, with the Wells score, all that sort of stuff. Um, ischemic heart disease, we commonly use algorithm-based probability assessments instead of our own judgment. This is for the better. Okay, so we've reached the first part of our decisions tutorial, the end of the chapter explaining how we make decisions. Next chapter is going to be about errors. I look forward to hearing from you all about this interesting topic and hopefully you'll tune into the next one. Bye.